to the essential experience now my guest mark sims sims correct that's sims yeah and i know this interesting person from a contact in the desert while when it was in the desert yeah from you wearing a spacesuit right and i forgot about it <laughs> and now here we are again right with you so deep in the field and i heard your story i heard your speech with your with your company and what you explored and i won't even go so much into you know that you know you had a company you sold it you retired quick mm -hmm. and uh, that helped you basically to, to ward off distortions that would disturb where you were going with what you were creating, correct? Well, so I've started uh, two companies, yeah. actually three, okay. but uh, I started two companies and um, then retired, took up ballroom dancing. And during that period of my life, I had this experience in Borrego Springs. Mm -hmm. Then as a consequence of that, I started a third company, a renewable energy company in Michigan, mm -hmm. building a hybrid wind and uh, solar charging station. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And decided uh, that that wasn't the best use of my skills and time, that I really wanted to go more the spiritual direction. And I felt that um, really what our planet needs isn't more Technology, technology-wise, I think we're good. Mm -hmm. I think we just lack spiritual learning and and uh, uh, awareness as a human family. So, as a spiritual sensitivity, a spiritual awareness. Yeah. Okay. And uh, and when I say a spiritual awareness, it's a it's a reverence one for life. Um, that's a big problem that we have as a human family. Mm -hmm. And with that, um, you know, taking uh, responsibility for ourselves and being stewards of this planet, you know, taking care of it, you know, uh, you know, appreciating nature, honoring nature, uh, the clean water, you know, so we're polluting the planet too much. There's too many of us behaving badly, you know, yeah, yeah. and irresponsibly, and we just need to we need to grow up from adolescence to adults. That's really what this is about. And doing that um, in a way that's spiritual, I believe, as well as rational mm -hmm. and uh, combines the best that science teaches us and spirituality has to offer. So what got you, mm -hmm. besides having that awareness, which is the baseline, you into the paranormal? to realizing ships are real that there's contact taking place people mm -hmm. being abducted people having visitations what got you like i gotta i gotta investigate i gotta go into this c5 thing boy um to, <laughs> i know there's a lot <laughs> yeah there, it's you know i'm just going back uh, you know this may not be the thing I, we should talk about during the interview mm -hmm. but um, in 2012, a number of events took place in sequence very close to one another mm -hmm. that I think ultimately was my preparation for my spiritual awakening. Mm -hmm. And that's what I call what happened on, in November of 2012. Mm -hmm. And uh, it began in the early part of that year of watching Stephen Greer's Disclosure Project video on YouTube. And that opened my mind to the possibility that we're not alone. Mm -hmm. I felt. I found those witnesses that gave their personal testimony very compelling, very uh, articulate, believable people. And if what were, they were saying was true, mm -hmm. this was the most important story in human history, and I wanted to know more about it. Mm -hmm. So you had that happening in the spring of 2012. Okay, so around that time. So that early mm -hmm. already, you were already mm -hmm. on the go. But right. Okay, this is where I need to be going. Uh, so I, that stirred up a curiosity for me and that led to me reading S Stephen Greer's book. So um, you, so I got interested in Greer, frankly, for organizing that event here with somebody who was not a government person or a military person who would organize. He was a civilian, yeah. you know, a doctor. And I learned quickly that he had uh, written three books at that time and so I bought and read them and that then led me to understanding his CE5 retreats that he do these ambassador uh, CE5 ambassador retreats mm -hmm. so uh, I was skeptical but I signed up for it for it in the summer 
of 2012. And then um, on the 11th of September, I saw, happened to see a post on uh, Facebook about the 9-11. Mm. And it was a, a post about an article written in the Denver Post uh, um, about this new documentary film that had come out about 9-11 mm -hmm. that was done by an organization called uh, Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. Mm -hmm. And it had become very controversial in the Denver area. It was the most requested documentary ever in the history of PBS. It was, a, it was being played on PBS um, in Denver and the article was an editorial about that whole thing. So I read it, then I, that led me to me watching that video and I was convinced after watching it that 9-11 was nothing like what the government told us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that took me down the rabbit hole of 9-11. And tied into the 9-11 story, when you got deep enough into that rabbit hole, was things like the UFO phenomenon, mm -hmm. which was what I was studying with about Greer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the fossil fuel industry and its lock on... That also plays a fact. I mean, what was essentially significant for you like what got me on the Stephen Greer thing was not his uh, almost lifelong studies is when these two sons appeared in Florida and yeah. they had seven cameras filming it and I watched the video and I can sense things and I, I got the chills and mm -hmm. almost shaking and I'm like okay th th these are objects yeah these are not uh, government craft these are gigantic ginormous right. orbs they would film with the Sony A7 and other cameras and right. the equipment. And he said, all cameras should be pointing. And I'm like, okay, I'm sold. Yeah. Like, this I was is there. Happening. I was there. That was January 27th, 2015. And I was there for this that. This was incredible. It like, was. This had me really like, I mean, I already have my I, own encounters, but for mm -hmm. them bringing that in, I'm like, okay, the CE5 thing I saw is, it. I brought my night vision goggles and I watched those after they went out, they descended into the ocean. Mm -hmm. Bef in front of the horizon there was no boats in the water there was no planes in the air to you know people who claimed there were flares they weren't because what you could i you know studied this very in great detail there were two of them one and then the second one appeared when the first one goes out this one's still going off there's no smoke from that and flares yeah. give a lot of smoke yeah, yeah. and there was none and i saw it descend with my night vision glasses it went into the ocean and the other one, when it went out, went into the ocean. And so I know for a fact those aren't fla those were not flares. I mean, I've, I've seen flares in military demonstrations. If anybody says that these standing lights mm -hmm. are flares, they got to be joking. Same with yeah. the Phoenix lights. Yeah. You cannot tell me that you have flares <clears throat> that are in the air for hours. Mm -hmm. in for you know a flare, you shoot a flare and it flares out. Right, right. This was in formation moving at a controlled pace mm -hmm. for hours. Well, it wasn't hours. It was three minutes. Was it three minutes? So the first one came on. It was on for three minutes. Oh, okay. And I the second was... one came on about a minute after the first one came on. No, it was only for three minutes. Only for three minutes? Yeah. Okay. So, okay, then I got the information wrong there. Yeah, you can watch the video. It's on Stephen Greer's so, serious so three minutes, website. I mean, the, the sun's... You're talking about the two suns, right? The two golden ships, yeah, as okay. Greer calls them, yeah. the twin ships. I, I refer to the Phoenix lights. Oh, they the Phoenix. They crossed the entire town. Oh, yeah, yeah. That, that, long, that long, long, yeah. No flare has that much no. ammunition to no. run. That's what I meant. Right. So not to confuse the two. Right. So the, the two suns were three minutes. I mean, also, if you psychically feel into it, um, you can sense there's something there. So you're also in the ongoing process, you're explaining Give me like essentially where you had like a crescendo where like, okay, there's something going on. Bring in also your own, if you want to, paranormal experience that yeah. you had yourself. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, okay. So um, I didn't have any paranormal experiences. I, I grew up, frankly, as an atheist my mm -hmm. entire adult life. Okay. So going into 2012, I'm an atheist, a hardcore devout atheist. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and I was very vocal about it on Facebook, on my social media page. Um, but what happened was I signed up for Greer's retreat, which is in November of 2012. Mm -hmm. And um, 
I went to that retreat. It was a six day event in Borrego Springs, California. And we meditated in the desert each night from about 8 p.m. until one in the morning. And on the fifth night, which was the night of November 15th, this green ship materialized. And the reason I brought my computers, I've got renderings of these that maybe I could, or I'll give them to you and you can in, yeah. just add yeah. them to your yeah, video. You can send the, the JPEG or whatever, yeah. or MP4, whatever you have, and I incorporate that in more. And I also then, so that night we saw this object appear. It materialized out of thin air. I saw it with my own eyes materialize and then dematerialize. And it was very quick, about three to four seconds, mm -hmm. which actually is a pretty long time. Um, but there were people that were there that did not see it that had their back in that direction because it wasn't directly above us. It was to the east, southeast mm -hmm. of our location. So... Um, so we, uh, um, or what was it east, northeast, I forget, but I think it was the east, southeast, and it was heading north and ended up in the east, northeast when it descended to the desert floor. Mm -hmm. So it was up in the sky, I would guess about a quarter mile, and it descended all the way to the desert floor, and then it disappeared. Mm -hmm. And it didn't like slow down the land, it was just going a steady speed, and I could see the stars behind it as it was materializing out of thin air and then it began dematerializing so that was a sequence of about three to four seconds and um and when i saw that i knew that we were that they're here you know that this was the answer to the question i went to go get answered and that question was are they real are they really here or not and um so that was three seconds that changed my life because I knew for sure that that wasn't a man-made craft. And uh, so later that night, I went back to my hotel room and I couldn't fall asleep because now your mind is Going. working on all the other questions that are naturally occurring. Yeah, and the rational fighting, trying to find an example why this couldn't be true. That's what well, I went through in the beginning, even though I had experience, always uh -huh. trying to, like, how do I anchor this in this reality? <laughs> yeah. It's... Uh, and to see something that was clearly non-physical, but to see something that was clearly non-physical coming out of thin air was, um, it wasn't cloaked. I mean, it was uh, multi-dimensional. It, it, it was phasing into our reality. Mm -hmm. And it was, the light itself was otherworldly. It was a light unlike any I'd ever seen before. It was pure, it was divine. It, it struck me with a sense of awe. Mm -hmm because it was this egg-shaped craft with a corona around it, a well-defined mm -hmm. green corona. It was just beautiful. It, was, it looked like a, an emerald egg. Opalist, well, this was greenish blue. And it, the aura was rainbowy. Oh, really? Around it. And you could look, it was interdimensional. I could look through the thing. Yeah, And yeah. he said, we're actually standing next to you, but you're not ready to see us yet. Uh -huh. You can't perceive that yet. And I said, why? And he said, the thing is with your heart. There's mm -hmm. still things that need to be worked on, but that's fully, fully open. Yeah. They can accept the you from the future. Uh -huh. You will see us. And we received downloads on Mount Shasta. And that was a craft parking 30 feet over our heads. Wow. And you would look at it and one part of you would get it and the other part would be like, this makes no sense. Yeah. Like, Because dimensionally, you can't fathom how this imprint comes in here. Right. And maybe you have some, some parallels to that. So when the craft came, it would sing like, uh -huh. and the grass and the trees would phase uh -huh. in the circumference of the field. They would dance. Mm -hmm. And we didn't have to eat for four days after that. Wow. We were so energized and so healed and so activated. So there was no, like people say, panic, no fear, euphoria, joy, tears of joy. That's the way I felt. And when they left, it's like lights out. Uh -huh. The craft didn't even disintegrate to turn like light switch. Uh -huh. And then we said, can you just reappear in a distance one more time? So we get it 50 miles down where there's two mountains um, uh, from uh, like on a side that that's Shasta and there's a mountain range. Mm -hmm. And behind that mountain range, they reappeared. Uh -huh. They showed themselves. They disappeared like clear communication, clear contact telepathic mm -hmm. but the tele telepathy was a knowingness mm -hmm. so we were called to the site we were six people around the fire and we were all this everybody have this 
instinctive feeling we all got to leave now uh -huh. and there's a place we need to go to and we all nodded like in unison and walked up there and sat down that's how they communicated wow. so i think they are in full control over this reality mm -hmm. so to people talking about false flag and invasion i don't want to go that negative i don't think that's necessary they have an intelligence that is you know beyond measure mm -hmm. and if they would they could pause earth if they want to exactly like this and everything right. would be at a standstill i've seen it so yeah let's continue with further experience of what, yeah. what else you accumulated and maybe parallels to what i've yeah. shared um so that night as i'm in my hotel room alone i'm pondering this new awareness um and the meaning of it and um so i want to know now that i know they're real i want to know where are they from what's their agenda what's the relationship to us why are they so reclusive and aloof you know that the government isn't keeping this a secret as much as they are yeah, yeah right yeah. so this isn't a government conspiracy this they're keeping themselves hidden for a reason so i'm starting to think about these things and then the idea occurs to me that that was such a major sighting what we saw that i'm i imagine that they're probably watching and um observing us to see how we'd, we'd respond. And I wanted them to know that I was ready for contact, that now that I knew that they were real, I'd been hearing earlier that week from Greer himself and others that claimed to have relationships with extraterrestrial beings. And I said, wow, what an opportunity. If I let that intent be known, who knows what might happen. Mm -hmm. And I believe that, um, well, Greer did say something that you could possibly have initiate face-to-face -face contact if you were prepared, properly prepared, and if you gave them permission. And that was something he stressed. You have to give them permission. And they have the ability to tell if you can handle a face-to-face -face contact. And then you have to feel that you're ready, that you're not going to freak out. And I knew I was ready. Mm -hmm. I, I was very eager to know the truth and to learn more from them. And um, so, uh, so I sat up in my bed because I wasn't going to sleep that night at all. Even though I was laying there tossing and turning, I was like, there's no use. And by this time, it was like 2, 2.30 in the morning, 3 o'clock. By, yeah, by that time, it was close to 3. So I, um, so I began doing the meditation in my bed, sitting up right in the lotus position, I closed my eyes and began the mantra he had taught us. And... In my mind's eye, I began noticing this dim, light blue whirlpool of light that was beginning to slowly move around. And it began getting brighter and coalesced into a well-defined sphere, a very bright, light blue sphere. And then these rings of light came into it, also light blue, into the sphere. And then that stopped for a moment. And then the sphere began changing shape and morphed into a humanoid figure mm. facing me so that's what we experience also that an orb can become a being uh, well that's what happened in my mind's eye okay, okay. so um i didn't hear him ever say that but that's yeah, yeah, what I, happened one to make me. sure i heard him is that an orb followed them into the hotel room okay and manifested into a full dude, dude. oh i've never heard him tell so, that story so they can travel like that oh yeah well i believe <laughs> spheres uh often are effectively Merkabas, yeah. you know, and that they can change shape. There into... can be ships in there. I mean, I see the right. guy who didn't post on uh, Facebook. He was in a contact group and he showed me that there was an instant healing. The guy had a problem with his liver, orb going into the body where the issue is, comes uh -huh. out of the body. The guy's healed, uh -huh. which they, the following day they realized the doctor and appointments, all that, the guy was healed. But you see the orb going into the camera. And he freezes the shot, and he sees two dudes at the dashboard in cruise control. <laughs> oh, you're kidding! Yeah, in a ship, flying that thing. Wow! And I saw it. Wow! And it was not posted. He showed that to us in private. You know, some people are more paranoid. Sure. But I saw it. Wow! Like that, like freaking Disney. That's amazing. Two, like gray type beings, but blue. Mm -hmm. Not hideous looking. Like some, you know, some of the hideous. Yes. They don't look like that. Very like like Buddha faces. Uh huh. Almost like Buddha masks in blue. Wow. And they would be controlling the aperture in the dashboard the control thing. Pattern, pattern. And, and, and they look and, and you see them. <laughs> that is so cool. I'm like, that's so amazing. So uh -huh. there are different modalities in what they can travel, these orbs, what they can carry. So yes. 
They can be windows, they can be ships, they can be beings. That is what I've seen and experienced also uh -huh. as well. Yeah. Well, I, I believe that, yeah. So, so I'm not surprised, you know, it's just so cool to hear su such a detailed, uh, you know, um, thing. Um, so anyway, as I had my eyes closed and this being is now standing before me, mm -hmm. um, it just stands there for what maybe. What did he look like? Well, he was, um, I have a picture that I've rendered, uh, um, of what he looked like. And, um, and I just continued looking at him for five minutes at least. He, I kept my eyes closed waiting for something to happen, either, either for him to dissolve and go away or walk, move, but he just stood perfectly still. So I opened my eyes and standing at the end of my bed is this being, this what's clearly a non-physical being because I could see through parts of his body. He was standing in front of a, of a uh, a window mm -hmm. in my hotel room mm -hmm. and I could see the curtains that my eyes had adjusted to the dark and even though there was no direct light in the room I could see through him and there there may have been an outside light that was shining through the window I don't recall exactly but uh, what I do remember is clearly being able to see through his body he it was very thin humanoid he the one of the unusual aspects of him is he had this pointy head. If you look at his face, um, he appeared to have these pupils mm -hmm. um, that were really weird in his eyes. And so as he's standing there and not moving, and I'm just burning into my memory what I'm looking at, I, yeah. I didn't know what was going to happen. It, maybe he would you know, just dissolve or disappear kind of like the ship did. Mm -hmm. So I was uh, wanting, first of all, to study him and burn into my memory because I'm a decent artist and I wanted to render a, a picture of him. Um, but he persisted, he stood there, and once I was sure that, you know, I could render a picture of him, I then gave a greeting that I had practiced. So before I started the meditation, I was not, I was frankly not, convinced that I could summon a being in my room. Mm -hmm. I just uh, wanted to give it a shot. Mm -hmm. And in the case, uh, unlikely case that it would happen, I wanted to prepare a greeting. I felt it was very important. So I thought about it and there were the three elements of the greeting that I came up with. One, to say I was grateful, that I was very honored and grateful mm -hmm. that they appeared. Second, that I desired a friendship with the being since I knew that was possible that other people had had these relationships. So I wanted that intention to be known. So I said something to the effect, I hope this is the beginning of a lifelong friendship. And then third, I said, um, I completely trust you to do with me and my body anything you choose. And the reason for that is because I had read Greer's books and had heard of other accounts that week I was in Borrego Springs from other experiencers that they claimed they had been taken aboard a craft mm -hmm. and I wanted I wanted to I just wanted no strings attached I wanted to be unconditional trust mm -hmm. and that was the intention little did I know that that was one of the keys that unlocked the experience that I then had mm -hmm. so as soon as I gave this greeting so when I gave this greeting um, he then began walking from the end of my bed and approached me on my left side and I'm staying very still. I didn't want to do anything to cause it to, you know, leave or whatever. And I just stayed still and I'm looking up. Now he's about maybe a foot and a half, two feet away from my face. And I ever so slightly turn my head so I can look him straight on. And as I'm looking directly into his eyes, I realize those things that I thought were pupils were not pupils. They, his eyes, in fact, weren't even eyes. They were sockets of a skull. And what I perceived as a pupil was the superior fissure and the orbital canal where the optic nerve from the eyeball goes to the brain. So these were, the, the, these were so sockets of a skull. So does that mean he wasn't fully materialized? Or were you not visible in your spectrum? I, I, so, at the moment I saw this, I had to do a double take. I'm looking deep in his eyes and I'm like double checking. Is this really what I'm looking at? And it was confirmed because I could see these sutures, these little lines that um, 
Did they have data in, in, inside the socket? They inside the socket. Past where the optic nerve would dock. You could see them leading there and outward if you look into a skull. That's how would I know? Well, if you look into the orbital of a skull, the eye orbital, there are these little platelets that make the orbital itself. And they buttress up against each other and they create these wavy lines. They're veiny like lines and they're called sutures. Okay. And so I could perceive those, I could see them. And that was a confirmation that indeed these were sockets of a skull, not eyes. He had holes there. And um, as I'm looking into his eyes, I'm also seeing patterns of light inside of his head because it's, he's transparent some, somewhat. His head was the brightest thing in his uh, anatomy, but I could see beyond the eyes into his skull and there were these um, light patterns, uh, like sacred geometry that mm -hmm. were forming, but they were moving. And, um, and, and so it was very hypnotic. I mean, it was like I was really pulled in. It's like divine art, uh, in anima and that consciousness and animation. What I believe th that Tejbar, this being that I was seeing, is a higher dimensional being in every sense of the word. Mm -hmm. And so if you're familiar with the concept of a tesseract, Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, after this experience, I began studying things like super string theory and multidimensional theory and uh, holographic theory. Um, and one of the things I came across were these beautiful computer illustrations where they show renderings of higher dimensional space uh, and objects mm -hmm. and that they rotate and they change size and they make these very beautiful patterns uh, that are very strange at first, but then you begin to see things that resemble things in 3D space, mm -hmm. even though they look very strange. And that's what what I was what I was looking at. Mm -hmm. Were the, but it was all light patterns. So um, as I'm eye gazing and seeing all this, I notice something's moving down here. So I look down, and he's coming at me with his right hand mm -hmm. towards my left elbow and he touches me, and I feel him touch me. It's a tingly sensation. And then he continues to push his finger into my elbow, very slowly at first, very slowly, and I'm feeling this tingly sensation grow where he's penetrating me, and I can feel the tip of his finger inside of my elbow. So he's continuing to go through now my left torso, through my back, and as his, as his hand is starting to go through the right side of my body, his right shoulder is beginning to merge with my left shoulder. Mm -hmm. And I didn't anticipate that sudden intensity of this tingly sensation where our bodies were beginning to merge. And it was already freaky enough. His arm now, yeah. his forearm is in my, inside of me. And when his shoulder hit my shoulder, I almost jumped up, but I forced myself to sit still. It mm. took every bit of willpower because your fight or flight response yeah, kicks have, in. Right. Yeah. And I had just promised him, you know, given him this promise that I totally trusted him and I want to honor that. And so as he's going into me, I'm starting to freak out already. Mm -hmm. And um, and so I'm saying, OK, sit still, sit still. And then the shoulder comes in and boy, it just took everything, all my willpower to sit still. And I just trusted in him. It was really scary. I was really scared. Yeah. Yeah. So he continues to, to move into my body, completely submerges himself, and for about a minute, there's that intense feeling. Tem pins and needles, you know, that it's static electricity is a good example combined with the pins and needles that you feel when, like, your arm falls asleep, mm -hmm. you know, that, that kind of thing. But it's head to toe. So uh, I ride that out. It was, uh, I give myself a lot of credit for sitting still through all of that. And then I notice it begins to dissipate. You know, this feeling begins to, you know, diminish. And eventually another minute is all it took. And I felt normal, you know, completely normal again. Although I had this very acute awareness that there's another being inside of me. There's another person or another entity so did he leave? Was that a contact and then he left? Or well, so I'm sitting there and I'm like, there's another dude in me. It was a man. It was a male, a male 
presence. And I'm just like, is this really happening to me? And I'm like, or am I just imagining this? What had just happened was very real, but I'm just wondering, did, you know, he just, am I imagining that there's another dude in me? So I'm thinking and I'm thinking, I'm like, yeah, there's a dude in me. And so I, my first question was, what's your name? And I said it out loud. I said, what's your name? And it was the first time I'd sp spoken that night because I had given that greeting telepathically. So I asked, what's your name? And he said, Tejpa. Using my, my, in fact, I'll, let me try to enunciate it perfectly the way he said it with my, my mouth and vocal cords. Tejbar. And I said, Tezbar? And he said, no, Tejbar. It was very forceful. I mean, it was a big deal to him. And I felt that. And so I said, can you spell it? And he said, T-E-Z-J-B-A-R, Tejbar. Just like that. Wow. Yeah. That's intense. <laughs> it was intense. <laughs> It was intense and and I got the seriousness of it you know he really wanted me to say it right and so I s repeated it now that he spelled it for me and I could hear him when he repeated it that time I could enunciate it properly and I put the energy into it and so it took me about five or six maybe eight times of repeating it out loud and I felt the satisfaction you know the the um, it, he didn't say yes but I felt this you know, I felt it. That That's he was sometimes what is scary is they want us in strictness to realize what's going on. Right. I had my uh, soul partner, my galactic twin, Krista, had an experience where an uh, ET comes to her and makes contact with her, but very strong sentence. Let this be not an automated response. Think for self. Very clear. Mm -hmm. because we're so asleep right and she was like the way she explained to me like, well that sounds kind of like forceful but it was made clear don't reply to me like an automaton right think for yourself and be aware and that's that's why i'm understanding your intense experience it kind of goes hand in hand i, I sometimes have those encounters mm -hmm. well i get it like this is it's not a game this is serious beyond serious <laughs> right it's a, a human race evolution but yeah continue so then I, my second question was, where are you from? And he said, I come from a place called Tierra del Fuego. You will find it at the southern tip of South America. Now, I never heard of Tierra del Fuego. I've never set foot in South America. My entire life, I've still not set foot in South that, America. That's on Earth? Yeah. It's, it, he said I'd find it at the very southern tip of South America. And so I stopped you know, my question and, uh, you know, asking him anything, I wanted to confirm this because again, I was still wondering, uh, am I imagining this? Me, you know, did I just create this alter ego? Mm -hmm. And I'm just talking to myself, mm -hmm. all instigated yeah. by this very real experience I just experienced. So I, uh, I wanted, I stopped, I got my computer and I fired up Google Earth and I typed in Tierra del Fuego, hit the search button, and the, the earth rotated and zoomed in to the southern tip of South America, and then Tierra del Fuego came up in letters right on, and I was dumbfounded, dumbfounded. I was, I, I just had chills, and... Um, so would we know what timeline that's from? Well, he said, he, he went on, well, let me continue yeah, yeah. in because I, he explains all this to me later, but you know, I just wanted to confirm that the, such a place existed before I continued my interview mm -hmm. with him. So before I put away my computer, I decided to uh, Google Tejbar, the way he spelled it. And there were, back in 2012, on the early morning of November 16th, there was only one hit in the entire Google library. And that was a link to a book uh, that was published in 1916 by a man named John Cooper, who was an anthropologist who had done uh, a book about the cultures of Tierra del Fuego, mm -hmm. the tribes and cultures of Tierra mm -hmm. del Fuego. I think it's, I forget the actual name of it, but um, I should, it's a long title, but it's basically the uh, the tribes and territories of, or, or the 
the cultures and territories of the tribes of Tierra del Fuego. Mm -hmm. And um, and so I clicked on the link and it took me to this uh, book that had been scanned and was in the books, the Google Books library. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, the book was there and I searched in my browser for the occurrence of Tejbar and I found it in the glossary in the back of the book where um, they had, you know, the, the author Cooper had translated words from uh, the Fuegian tongue into phonetic English. Mm -hmm. And there was a word, Tejbar, spelled T-E-Z-J-B-A-R, that means forehead, which kind of blew me away, right? Because this whole experience began with, you know, this third eye visualization. And um, so I put away my computer, continued my interview, and he went on to explain to me that he had lived roughly 3,000 years ago. He was a chieftain of a mighty tribe. Mm -hmm. And when he died, he ascended to the astral realm. And I said, so uh, that sounds sort of like heaven. And he said, yes, that is what the Christians would call heaven. And I said, so the Christians are right about heaven? And, and he said, yes, um, but it's more complicated than the simple concept of Christian heaven but, uh, that you know. And I said, so is this where I'm gonna go when I die? And he says, no, one of two things happen when you have a physical death. Either you're reincarnated, that's what you typically, typically happens to continue your spiritual and conscious evolution. And when you meet certain criteria, you then will ascend. And I asked him, what is the criteria? What are the requirements for ascension? And he, he said, basically to table that discussion that I wasn't ready to know. So um, then we, then I was curious about, um, you know, my, about reincarnation. I said, so who was I before I was Mark Sims? If, cause I'm an atheist, right? I'm, yeah. I'm hearing this as an atheist and yeah. I'm still in, you know, I was still like, I was kind of believing him, but yeah. you know, it was hard, you know, for a lifelong atheist to, so I was, I'm just not gonna take it um, for, you know, on first word. So I wanted to know more. I said, okay, so who was I before I was Mark Sims? And he says, you were a wolf. And I'm, which really surprised me because I was practically came out of the womb howling. And as a very young child, I would howl and imagine myself being a wolf. And I've always had this deep connection with a wolf. Mm -hmm. One of my first pets was a dog I found in the woods that was a wolf dog. And uh, I found her when she was 11 years old as a puppy. Mm -hmm. And that story is very strange. I look back at it now as that was probably, this was a puppy that was put in a specific, where I was walking in, the, or I was riding my bike in the woods. Mm -hmm. And there was a, um, this was behind a grocery store, a, well, uh, a supermarket actually. And um, they had trimmed a bunch of trees in the back to clear for the semis to come through. And there was a huge, stick pile of mm. these limbs and sticks. And this pile was probably about 12, 15 feet in diameter and four or five feet tall of twigs and, and branches. And on the top of that pile was this puppy. And there was nobody in the back of the parking lot. It was, you know, there was nobody there. It was like, it had to have been after closing hours or maybe on a Sunday. I don't remember exactly what day it was, but I was 11 years old and there's this puppy whimpering so I had to climb up on the wood pile to save it. And as I was climbing up, the, the dog was, um, this puppy was moving. It was starting to sink into the wood pile. So I had to reach down in the wood pile and pull her out. And I tucked in my t-shirt and I put her head and she, her little head was like this. And I rode my bike home and I adopted her. My parents let me keep her. And so, um, but you know, my connection with the wolf has been there my entire life. So when he said this, I was like, whoa, you know, that's... Uh, that's a totally new aspect to interdimensional contact and mm -hmm. life and reincarnation. And uh, so, so, yeah, so I, I, um, so I, I just assume, so he went on to share with me about how we evolve consciously through lifetimes and that this process begins in the animal kingdom mm -hmm. and then we eventually 
graduate to becoming human. Mm -hmm. So we have our first incarnation as a human after we've you know, been thousands upon thousands of different animals. And he described that process to me. So I assumed for quite a while, uh, for the first um, few months of my experience that I, that Mark Sims was my first human incarnation. Although mm -hmm. I found out not long, you know, a few months later that I had been a Native American mm -hmm. um, before the wolf and that I was reincarnated as a wolf to pay a karmic debt because I had murdered an alpha male wolf because I wanted to wear its skin. And I was a Lakota warrior. So um, I, ha I had to reincarnate as a wolf to pay that karmic debt. And I, and Tejbar explained to me that um, uh, that even though I was paying this karmic debt, that being the wolf in my l most recent lifetime was preparing me for this lifetime. Mm -hmm. So I, I was a very, I've been a very successful businessman, mm -hmm. and I've always kind of considered myself a bit of a lone wolf. Mm -hmm. You know that, uh, you know, I'm very focused and driven and an overachiever. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I build great teams around me, but I'm alpha. And so I've always had that kind of spirit in me. And to, according to Tejbar, that spirit came from my most recent lifetime. Mm -hmm. And I did start a, a, a wolf clan. And, uh, and I, so anyway, um, um, so as we're having this discussion yeah. about, uh, reincarnation and the astral realm, this place that very much seemed like heaven to me based on his description of it. Um, I was getting an education about the reality uh, of our soul and its evolution and how this process works. The modus operandi of spiritual development and conscious evolution uh, takes place through reincarnation through lifetimes and that's where our natural instincts develop in the animal kingdom that prepare us for human, the human kingdom, so to speak. And, um, and that, um, uh, I lost my train of thought there for a second, but, um, so basically that your, your experience in how Tash, Tash Bar explained to you who you were, but you making sense out of this contact finding the place where he's from, right. he, he lived, and uh, why is he contacting you? Why is this all happening? Right. So, so as we're having, so re remember that here I am, an atheist, getting all this information in a very short time frame mm -hmm. from the moment he communed with me. So he explained this, that what, I, what we were experiencing together was a communion. Mm -hmm. And he described it as the union of three things. The physical body, my physical body, with my soul, my evolving soul, which he called a astral body, mm -hmm. and then his celestial or etheric body. And later he presented a model uh, that I actually wrote down in a chart that had three levels to it. Um, at the bottom, you have the physical realm the astral realm above that and the celestial realm above that. Mm -hmm. And he went on to go into great detail about the relationships between these three levels of, of uh, or realms of consciousness of reality. Mm -hmm. He called them the realms of creation. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we, according to Tejbar, are the combination of uh, two of these realms that we have this immortal part of us, the soul, mm -hmm. that's an astral body developing inside of our physical body. And when our physical body dies, the astral body is released to either be reincarnated or to ascend to its next level of conscious evolution. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then he eventually shared with me that the requirements for this graduation was mastering unconditional love. Mm -hmm. So I said to him, I said, so what is unconditional love? Uh, by your definition, and how does one then master it? And he says, that's for you to figure out on your own. So, and he's helped me along the way, but I've done a lot of work on that. And I, um, I think he's given me some breadcrumbs, but most of the work was my own work. Once I knew that this was kind of 
let's call it a quest, and I knew the general direction to go. Um, I just began reading, you know, books about love and what people had to say about unconditional love. And, you know, it took me eight years to discover ultimately what it was. I had, across those eight years, had suspected it, but um, initially I had believed that it was the kind of love we have for our children. You know, my I have a daughter who's now 31, uh, soon to be um, 32, and uh, she's, um, uh, actually she's gonna be 31, no, yeah, 30, she's gonna be 31 this June. Um, and uh, so, she, uh, growing up, um, you know, I, I have always been very proud of her, but I knew that there was nothing she could do that would cause me not to love her. You know, she could cause, she would could do anything. And, and, you know, if she committed a crime, she murdered somebody, whatever, any horrible thing, I would still love her and never abandon her. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was the kind of unconditional love that, was going on here, the kind of love we have for children, but that isn't at all what he was referring to. It's the love, the unconditional love for self. And, um, and what's so powerful about that is that we cannot truly love others unconditionally unless we love ourselves unconditionally. And you only can love yourself unconditionally if you forgive yourself for any of your transgressions. We all have them. Nobody's perfect by default. You know, we are human beings, we make mistakes. And for those of us that are perfectionists, and I'm certainly one of those, um, I have carried, you know, guilt with me for nothing major, but, you know, just things I did as a child that, you know, I did out of naive, naivete or, you know, just uh, poor judgment mm -hmm. that I, you know, so. I began, um, when I discovered the, the, that this is the unconditional love he was referring to, I began doing a life review in meditation and coming across everything that I had any regret about, any guilt, mm. and I forgave myself. Mm -hmm. And I would look at myself in the mirror after that meditation and say, I love you. You are a good man, because I am a good man, even though I've done some you know, I've never we're killed all, any. Yeah, we're all not perfect. I mean, right. You know, I, like, like you, I've never killed anybody, but I had to forgive myself in situations where I wouldn't forgive myself. Like, mm -hmm. we call it theta healing, where you're most susceptible. If you do forgiveness work, you dissolve timelines, you dissolve spells, curses, right. whatnot. Forgiving yourself and not having the awareness to not do it again. Like once you know, that's right. then it becomes a choice. That's right. And then you're accountable. So that's right. I totally uh, get that. And I know there's tons of more stories, so I want to keep this short yeah. for my listeners. And thank you for sharing all of this. And just to wrap it up, so what's your overall message in, your, in this mission here What you're communicating to the people now? Well, to your audience, I believe most of them, if they're watching this far along, are very conscious people, you know, individuals. And so I think they already get, you know, what I've been sharing. And if I were to give one message, the most important thing, and this is something that Tejbar told me was the most important thing he could teach me. It wasn't unconditional love because that's something I had to learn on my own. But he said, um, it, he, he ter had a term for it. it. It's the power of thought consciousness. And it's the idea that your thoughts are very powerful. And so what you think is what you manifest. So keep your thoughts good, you know, keep them positive. Don't let frustration, anger, sadness, or depression stay with you for long. You can have those emotions, they're part of being human, but just don't let them reside in your heart and grow. You know, move forward, forgive yourself, or, you know, find something that will bring you out of depression that makes you happy, anything. It could be music, it could be just being in the sunlight. Um, whatever makes you happy, uh, do that, and, uh, and the good things will come. So, 
from our thoughts, our emotions follow, and from our emotions, our actions. So be very mindful of your thoughts and what you let reside in your in your mind. Yeah, that wraps it up. Yeah. Thank you so much. Oh, I appreciate you, brother. Yeah, I appreciate and, you. And a synchronistic uh, meet meet again, and I'm learning over and over again. So this is phenomenal. <laughs> And uh, like I say to my audience, see you on the flip side. All right. Yeah, that's Thank it. you. Yeah.